All right, it's official. I have lost my fucking mind. Be crumbled so wildflowers will come up where you are. You have been stony for too many years. Try something different. Surrender. Rumi. This video should probably come with a warning. A warning about existential crisis. Or crises. Or crises. Anyway, the thinking here, what we're going to discuss, can trigger it. So if you don't feel like spending the rest of your night curled up in a ball on your bathroom floor, maybe skip this one. Somebody in the comments suggested that I read the book Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, and I did. And I wasn't sure t what to expect, but I think I'm happy that I did. Uh, no, I, I'm, I am happy that I did. My existential tumbling is not the result of this book. I think it's just a result of my searching in general. That being said, I think this book is, is probably a, a good thing to read on this journey. The comment was on my book therapy video for the book Awareness by Anthony DeMello. And if the book Awareness is a call to something hidden in plain sight, describing the indescribable, the ineffable, the cosmic, then the untethered soul is more of a guide, a field book, um, Lego instructions, if you will. This book is more practical steps to become aware, real tangible ways to sit in the seat of the self, which I like because I, I feel like throughout this search, with my depression, anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, blah, 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 blah. With all this stuff, with, with my search, with my seeking, I always come across these leaders or these gurus or these, these speakers who say, let it go. Just let it go. To that I say, what the f does that mean? I, <laughs> I really want to know. Uh, and I've wondered that. And this book, it feels like gets into that more. This book is, it feels like practical steps. And that's what I was looking for with this book. A practical way to change. Anthony DeMello made me feel like a fucking crazy person without the, <laughs> the tools or the instructions to, to get it, to find it. Even though he's saying you don't need to find it, it's right there. It's like, I need, I, my personality, I need some help. I need, I, I want some instructions. I need a goal. <laughs> Woo! And on my search for happiness, contentment, peace, I feel like a lot of the, the therapies that I've come across, that I've tried, just feel like band-aids. Now I know that's not probably completely true. It's hard to look at yourself as yourself to see all the progress that you've made, the changes that you've made. You're living it. You're, it's, it's hard to see it. It's hard, it's hard to, to get past the problem in your mind that's created by your own mind with your mind. But I've just felt like I've had a lot of band-aids for concepts in this temporal life that we didn't choose. It's all these things that we didn't choose. They were fed into us with flashes, like subliminal messaging to a super soldier in a movie. Like they flash all the things in front of their face, like, and it, and it, it wash, it brainwashes them. Mind washes. I need a mind wash. But it's all these things, Gerber and Coca-Cola and dollar bills and I'm yelling. And sugar. It's all force fed into us. And I'm not railing against these things, this American life. I am blessed to be able to be free and to live the life that I have. I, I use Amazon, I drink LaCroix, I go to Chipotle every day. As the comedian Samantha Irby says, I am a simple person, kind of. I mean, I don't really have any dreams beyond comfortable pants and unlimited sparkling water. 
And I agree, Samantha. I used to think sparkling water was garbage. Now, I get it. I know how lucky I am. I, I, maybe I don't. Maybe I need to think about that more. But I still, I still want to strive for something better. I, not better, peace. I just want some peace. It makes me feel guilty that I get frustrated with the life that I am complicit in living. And that's, I guess, where I need to let it go. Let it go. Let it go, let it go. When I'm up in the sky. I'm the only person in the world who doesn't know the lyrics to that song. Great song. I wanna tap into this this more, this this universe, this Atman, this internal God or Godhead or connection to the divine. Because my Mazda Miata isn't doing it. It's not giving me <laughs> pure satisfaction and bliss. But that's not it. That's not it. It is enjoying what's right here. And I don't know how someone like Eckhart Tolle constantly finds that that's enough for him. I just watched an interview with him and Russell Brand and he was saying that he is able to sit and just look at the trees and, and enjoy it and love it and be calm. And I think that's great. But then he said, I'm also able to just look at the furniture and just enjoy the infinite amount of peace that comes from that. That's great. How the f do you do that? Because when I sit and look at my furniture, I am bombarded by one trillion thoughts and then my leg itches and then I have to pee. So how do you do it, Eckhart? I want something more because all this stuff, this temporal stuff that we are conditioned to go for, to find, to achieve, to get the job, to get the girl, to get the guy, to get the car, to get the vacation, to get the watch, to get the shoes. It's gotta be the shoes. It doesn't feel like anything. They're just the concepts. And that's what I'm really struggling with. Awareness and Untethered Soul and some other books that I've been reading on this journey, they start to dissolve concepts. And when you dissolve concepts, you start to dissolve what feels like the value of why you live. And that's a, a tricky place to be. Because I understand that there are things that give me pleasure and pain, but I'm, I don't know what they mean anymore. And and what pleasure and pain actually mean as a concept. This is getting real heady. You want more, you know? It reminds me of a story that I read in Fumio Sasaki's Goodbye Things, a book on minimalism and moreover peace in simplicity. And he said that there was a, a gentleman, Tal Ben Shahar, a popular Harvard lecturer in positive psychology, he became Israeli national squash champion at the age of 16. His five years of six hour daily practices paid off. But once he got home after the victory ceremony, he realized that the joy had worn off and he was left with a feeling of emptiness. He told people that the happiness lasted for only three hours. What the fuck? And this is something that isn't <laughs> it's not abnormal. You hear this all the time. In one of my favorite books that I've read, Lost Connections by Johan Hari, in an interview within the book, it says, we live under a system that constantly distracts us from what's really good about life. It feels like we construct this false solidity to protect ourselves and get lost in it. These jobs, these cars, these shoes. But I don't know if they really help us or if it's just a, a veil of deceit. And when do we pull it back? When do we find out? When we die? I don't wanna have that deathbed regret. These concepts are falling apart for me. It reminds me of what Sadhguru says in the book Inner Engineering. If someone spoke, 
I realized they were only making sounds and I was making up the meanings. Sometimes I wonder if we're even in control of the meanings that we make up or if they are just thrust upon us, if they grow out of our subconscious, a subconscious that has been watered by an infinite amount of advertising that we don't even notice anymore. And this is where it gets hard for me because it's like I, I try and look at all these books and, and, and therapies and theories and I feel like you do everything right but the world of the senses is still hard. What if I could tap into something different? What if there is something different? That's what this book really gets into. This book gets into the self with a capital S. And again, this sort of concept is described in different ways depending on the author. But this self is the seat of the self, the watcher of what is actually happening. A, a third person or entity or universe that is experiencing life through you. Like Jim Carrey said in an interview, I used to be a man experiencing the universe, and now I feel like I'm the universe experiencing a man. I was talking about this at a poker table the other day, but people looked at me like I was crazy, and I get it. But it's not, it's not a new idea, this mysticism, this idea of connecting to a oneness and whether that you describe that as God or the universe or the simulation. It's not new, but it's definitely weird to wrap your head around. Even though this book is saying that that's where, that's where peace comes from. You can steal peace from this because the, the, your self, your, your human self, your sense self, your temporal self is experiencing all these things, whether it be good or bad, the whole spectrum. But if you shine a spotlight on what is actually experiencing it, you see that that self that is experiencing it is separate from the experience and the experiencer. So it is always clear, it is always neutral, it is always beige. <laughs> it's always there to experience it. If you're angry or hurt or upset or happy or joyous or orgasming, that self isn't any of those things, it's just watching it. So if you shine the spotlight on that self, You're supposed to be able to see that everything's okay. Now, I don't know what this means if you're drunk or asleep or dead, where that self goes. And of course, nobody can really explain it. Some people would say that's where faith comes in. But I'm not sure you even need faith to believe that this experience or this practice has value because you can see it, you can experience it, you can do it. You don't need faith to shine the spotlight on the self and to experience that, whoa, that's neutral. There's something different there. It's been messing with me a lot. <laughs> this book says you can steal peace from this self always there. Shine the spotlight on it. But it's hard because you feel yourself constantly coming back to the temporal world, to the ego, to the sense of what's in front of you happening in the sense world. For me, it feels like I'm being pulled back and forth between shining a spotlight on the self and then being lost in, in my sadness and existential angst. Pema Chodron says, everywhere we go, we see the misery that comes from buying into the eight worldly dharmas. It's also pretty obvious that people need help and that there's no way to benefit anybody unless we start with ourselves. 
our motivation for practicing begins to change and we desire to become tamed and reasonable for the sake of other people. We still want to see how the mind works and how we get seduced by samsara, but it's not just for ourselves. It's for our companions, our children, our bosses. It's for the whole human dilemma. And I feel that because I want to get better for me and I want to be better for other people. I don't like when I'm down and I don't like what that does to other people. Friends, my family, regular strangers. When you put out that energy, you get that back and it just, it compounds on itself like a shitty snowball, like a pea snowball which I don't, wouldn't that melt? Whatever, a yellow pea snowball. In Inner Engineering, Sadhguru says, the human predicament is just this. The very seat of your experience is within you, but your perception is entirely outward bound. This reminds me of a quote from Kipling, where he says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. I feel like the self does that. It sees both just the same. It's not good or bad, it's just seeing it. And if you can tap into that feeling of just seeing it, you are left, you as your human self are left unaffected as well. It's the stoic philosophy of releasing control of the external and controlling your reaction to it. Rain isn't bad or good but how you react can make it so. It's hard because it's this voice inside versus the one who listens to it. It's weird to keep shining the spotlight on that and thinking about that. Because this voice, this voice inside of you, this voice that you're used to hearing, this voice that argues with itself, it's constantly moving towards comfort and conspicuousness and power. It takes awareness to snap out of it because it's easily swayed either way. Good, bad, it'll find it, it'll see it, it'll move towards it. And that's why in this book, Michael Singer talks about consciously moving away, distancing yourself from the fake film that's playing in front of you. Distance from it, see it from the seat of the self, looking at it. Katie Waldman talks about that in the book, Can We Control the Voice in Our Head? And she says, the rhetorical device of Iliism is the habit of referring to oneself in the third person. Julius Caesar was an early adopter. Illy means he in Latin. This vainglorious tactic becomes something else, a coping mechanism with a new label. Now we can call it distant self-talk. High usage of first person singular pronouns, I, I'm mad, I'm sad is a reliable marker of negative emotions. So, as Katie states, it's better to adopt the vantage of a neutral observer. Katie is scrambling to meet her deadline, not me. Katie is sad, Katie is happy. This way of talking may sound like an excited teenager on TikTok, but apparently it's helpful. Eckhart Tolle says, because once you have disidentified with your mind, whether you're right or wrong makes no difference to yourself at all. Your sense of self is then derived from a deeper and truer place within yourself, not from the mind. The self is unaffected, always. Always comes out on top. <laughs> and you know it because it, it's always there to witness through your whole spectrum of experience. It's there, it's witnessing it. As Michael Singer says, shine the spotlight on it. It's witnessing. And that may be why it's so easy to get separated from it, because it's always there, working in the background, whether you look at it or not. It fades into the background because it is the background. Ooh! The background of space and time. <sighs> With this, you look at things differently then, or at least you're supposed to. Uh, or you just go crazy, like me. Michael Singer says, then you are able to start letting these things move through you. These things that make you happy, sad, angry, excited. They can move through you like 
trees passing when you're driving. You don't notice every single tree as you're driving. They just, they, they, they pass by you. They flow through you. They flow through your eyes, through your brain, out your butt. <laughs> they, they flow through you. And that's not the goal, but the version of what sitting in the self, I think is supposed to feel like. Everything flows through you. It reminds me of the third tenet of logotherapy from Viktor Frankl, where he says that we should experience life because it's what we have. And because it's what we have, we should do our best to experience it. Even if you don't have the answers for it, it's what you have. So how can you honor that? Another thing that he talks about in, in the book is that when you start to do this, when you start to try and look at things from the self, when you shine the spotlight on the self and, and you try and let things flow through you, he says that random memories will start to come up. And I don't know if this was just from suggestion, but it really seemed to for me. He says that these things flowing through you will trigger energies, will trigger memories. And I, I found that really interesting because I had these weird random memories that came out that felt like they had been waiting to come out to, to flow through me as opposed to me stuffing them inside or, or hiding them or, or shutting them down. No wonder why we're in pain because we have all these things that we're like, nope, I don't wanna feel that. Nope, not today, sir. Not gonna feel it, no. That's going deep down, deep down, deep down. Apparently, we all, we shut down, we, we, we protect, we, we, we put a, a, a metal fence around our heart, a metal case around our heart so that these things can't get in. But what we're actually doing is locking them inside of this case, keeping it inside of our heart, poisoning our soul. At least that's what he's saying. And it kind of feels that way when you start exploring it. The author Julie Bunton in the book Marlena says, tell me what you can't forget and I'll tell you who you are. That one cuts deep. <laughs> These memories that I've noticed coming up, they, 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 they seem to bring me back to around fifth grade. That, that seems to be a seminal part of my life. When I started therapy, or when I restarted the third version of therapy in my 20s, this part of my life seems to come up a lot. And I seem to have some sort of intense memories and blockages, those energy blockages, memory blockages from around that time. Because around this age, when you have all these hormones going through you, you start to have these, these, these thoughts that are, are new and crazy and insane and, and weird and big to you. Uh, whether it's sexual or violent or both, you have all these, these crazy thoughts that come up. And for some reason, I, I didn't talk to anybody about it. I just felt like I was abnormal and weird and, and, and a monster for, for thinking some of the things that I thought. And then as a fifth grader, I told myself this story. And now as someone in my mid thirties, I realized I've been telling myself the same fucking story. This fifth grader has control over my adult brain. I don't want a fifth grader to have control over anything <laughs> besides the fucking crayon box. Get out of my brain, man. <laughs> there are these things that we tell ourselves about ourselves, these stories, but are they true? Or do we only think them? And does it even matter? But these truths, these stories that we've decided about ourselves, they can affect our whole lives if we let it. One thing, one thought can pull your awareness down and fuck up your whole life with a whole vicious cycle. But what I didn't realize until more recently was that my fucked up thoughts, my crazy thoughts were actually, once you get past the grotesqueness, we're a wonderful expression of creativity. This is something that got into my head when I was 10 years old and I've been telling myself the story ever since that I need to hide it, that I need to be shameful. I'm 35. 
this was when I was 10. But it, it feels like for so long I've just been, it feels like I, 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 I've just been a monster who's been tricking people. That I don't deserve anything great. That I only deserve to exist. And maybe not even that. And I wonder how many other people feel that way. What their version of their story is about why they don't belong. Or why they don't deserve peace. I started to have these weird thoughts. Now I know that they were completely normal for a fifth grader who's 10 years old. But at that time, in, in my mind, I thought I was Silence of the Lambs. I thought I was Anthony Hopkins. What? Fava beans? Fava beans. <laughs> I saw that movie too young. This was a big epiphany for me. But just because I, 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 I found this or realized this doesn't mean that it makes everything all better. This is a lot of conditioning that I need to keep working through. Eknath Iswaran says in the Bhagavad Gita, healed of their sins and conflicts, working for the good of all beings, the holy sages attain nirvana in Brahman. The other night I woke up from a dream and I wrote down in my notebook next to my bed, the words fade, but the feelings remain. We have all these random memories, beautiful and sad and everything in between. And we might not remember exactly how it happened, but we can remember the smell, or the feeling, or the pain. And that's got to go somewhere. So it either festers from the inside out, or it passes through. Mr. Singer says that we should keep moving past stimuli to let it flow through us. And only then can we sit in the seat of the self. Can we keep tapping into this peace? Can we steal peace from the self? He says, you are sick because you're protecting yourself too much. It's a paradox because you want to protect yourself from the outside, but what's happening is you're taking something in and then not letting it out. Physically and energetically, we have to experience, but then release and let go. Again, what the f does that mean? <laughs> I think we're getting closer. Life seems to be over and over and over and an opportunity to experience and to practice this, to get out of your own way over and over and then over again. Let go of each thing as it comes and experience life. Anthony DeMello says the way that you experience and enjoy a symphony is you let the notes go. You don't, you don't go back and, and, and hold on a note, you let them go. The beauty comes from hearing the peace, from the silence, from the movement, from the flow. You keep moving forward, you let go. Mmm, that's sweet. Ow, that hurts. Mmm, eggs. It's all an opportunity to experience life. I tend to worry a lot. I ruminate on the past and worry about the future. It reminds me of a quote from Mark Twain. I've had a lot of worries in my life most of which never happened. But what about for the things that have happened? Well, they have happened, so why am I resisting them? Handle it, figure out the next smallest step, move forward. Leo Babauta says, experience the world free of views. In any moment, we can simply let go of our views and see the world just as it is. See the objects, the light, the colors and textures, the space of the world around us. See the other person simply as a collection of matter and energy. Just experience the moment as direct experience, not as a part of a narrative that we have in our heads. This is true freedom. And it's simply being in the moment, free of views, just experiencing. It's like when you've been out in nature, fully immersed in the experience without really thinking anything. Lazily laying in the grass, staring up at the trees and sky, floating in the ocean, feeling one with the water, on vacation in a hammock, fully relaxed and without any worries. This is the freedom available to us in any moment. I tried to do this once on vacation at home in Wisconsin. I laid in the grass 
and looked at the birds catching the bugs in front of me at dusk. This was great. But then I found out that a tick had burrowed into my leg and I got Lyme disease. So take this advice with a grain of salt. <laughs> That's fucked up. I just totally undercut his quote. But really, it's great to think about how no matter what you're doing, you don't need more. You don't need this trip, this new car, these new shoes. It's gotta be the shoes! Try and look at the furniture and see the wonder of it all. Richard Rohr says, if we want to build our life on a solid foundation, we need to base it on God who loves us unconditionally, constantly, and without exception. Then we don't go up and down. We know who we are, now and forever. And whether you're religious or not, that's what this sense of self seems to tap into, this universal neutrality, this universal uh, peace, this letting go. Laughter is similar, if not the same thing, to letting go. Marky McMillan writes, Laughter is the evidence that the chokehold of shame has been loosened. Knowing laughter is the moment we feel proof that our shame has been transformed. Like empathy, it strips shame to the bone, robs it of its power and forces it from the closet. These memories need to come up, they need to go somewhere. And for me, I, I feel like humor can be a great part of this. Pema Chodron says, finally, couldn't we just relax and lighten up? When we wake up in the morning, we can dedicate our day to learning how to do this. We can cultivate a sense of humor and practice giving ourselves a break. Every time we sit down to meditate, we can think of it as training to lighten up, to have a sense of humor, to relax. God, it would feel good to relax. Oh, when we bear down on things, that's, that's when there seems to be a problem. I, especially for me, when I have this fear and the need to control, it keeps your life small. Brene Brown says, you can have courage and you can have comfort, but you can't have it at the same time. All of this stuff comes up as what Michael Singer describes as the thorn, or at least my version of the thorn. He says, you must remove the thorn. I have this object in front of me and I get lost in that. Come back to the self, remove the thorn, this object, this distraction, this pain, experience it. You have to take out the thorn, otherwise it'll ruin your life. You can put a band-aid on it, but the thorn is still in there, still festering, still hurting you. I'd like to fill up my cup so I can help others, or at least repair the hole that's in mine, or glue back the glass together after it's been shattered on the floor. My cup of sanity! I will glue it back together, like the Japanese art process of kintsugi. It's amazing, the gold, the golden glue that makes imperfection beautiful. And once you work on this over and over, you get to the point where you, you see that the fear and the pain only gets so bad that you can experience it, that you are courageous enough, that you have the power, that you have the energy, that you have the ability to experience it and not die and not fall, and not fall apart. And when you see that, when you see that you are able, that comes with a certain amount of freedom. Because then, what are you afraid of anymore? You can let this ultimate pain flow through you. And Michael Singer says you can learn to love this pain in your heart as it passes through. This is the fire of yoga. He calls this an edge. And there is freedom in meeting that edge in looking at it in the face, because that points to your freedom. These edges point to your freedom. Because he says the more that you practice this, the more nothing can ever bother you except these edges. And when that's the only thing that ever bothers you, it's great because you know what to do with them. You know to appreciate them because they are the physical representation of your freedom, of your comfort zones, of what's stopping you and at the same time beckoning you to move forward. The comedian Jacqueline Novak says in her book, How to Weep in Public, most people pace their soul searching over the course of a lifetime, grappling with the suffering of the human condition when events inspire it. Resist this willy-nilly approach and dive face first into the darkness as a child. Leap at it like it's a slip and slide with enthusiasm and a running start. 
despite knowing there are rocks in the grass and that pain is inevitable. Welcome it. Yes, Jacqueline. Let's f***ing dive in. <laughs> Let's knock those walls down. Michael Singer says the psyche, this identity that we protect ourselves, is surrounded by a field of a trillion billion stars. If only we were to knock the walls down, to push past our comfort zones, our edges, and to look. Wow. Then we will see. Wow. I've never heard it phrased this way, but he says in the book to make happiness unconditional. Make happiness unconditional and cross into nirvana. When you think about it, you're really of no use miserable and you are gonna die anyway. So if you're gonna be here and experience this, why not fall into happiness instead? This reminds me of a line from Atticus poetry. We are much more useful to the world in forgiving ourselves than hating ourselves. And I'm not sure I've ever heard it phrased that way before. I've heard of unconditional love, but unconditional happiness hits different. Can I make the choice to be unconditionally happy? Is this better than a Band-Aid? Because it feels like all this other stuff have, have just been Band-Aids for decapitations. <laughs> Hasn't really helped. Or maybe, maybe it has. I mean, I'm still here but it just, maybe it doesn't feel like enough or like a universal truth. Although I don't know if that's even possible because we simply can't explain what this is. I mean, this is YouTube, but <laughs> what this YouTube thing is inside of, besides the internet, besides the human experience, besides the universe, besides this simulation, this, God, experiencing the self over and over and over. Oh my God, is the universe just experiencing life through separate beings? Does this all lead back to becoming a simulation? Or even with multiple dimensions, would that support the idea that the universe is trying to express itself in the infinite? Or to experience all that there is to experience and then collapse in on itself again? All of this can lead to, again, the existential ball of crises on the floor in the bathroom. But it reminds me of what Josh Grizzetti says in his book, God in My Head. Our purpose, therefore, is simple, to experience life. That's it. So maybe we are just here to experience. Maybe that's what this is. And again, if we're just here to experience, why be mad about it? Learn to love the absurd. Learn to love the absurdity of what this is, of what all these weird f***ing concepts are. Find the freedom in that. It doesn't matter if someone likes your Instagram photo. It doesn't matter if someone hates you and yells at you. It doesn't matter if your refrigerator breaks. <laughs> what the f*** am I even talking about? It doesn't matter because if you come back to this self, apparently there's peace there. Howard Thurman says in Jesus and the Disinherited, the awareness of being a child of God tends to stabilize the ego and results in a new courage, fearlessness, and power. I have seen it happen again and again. I'm kind of waiting on this power and fearlessness and courage thing, but I kind of get what he's saying. I feel like I've tapped into to pieces of it. Seneca said, all that you behold, that which comprises both God and man is one. We are the parts of one great body. This body that is temporal, that is not gonna last forever. Michael Singer says that we should contemplate death and be free. It reminds me of the stoic phrase, memento mori, remember death. Remember that you will die. And this isn't supposed to be some sort of depressing thing. It's supposed to be that you are being naive if you expect that tomorrow will come for you or for anyone else. And that's one of the problems with modern life. Modern life convinces you that you have 78.6 years on this earth, that you will have this time, and that each day goes slowly, and that you are bored, and that you are in pain. But in reality, or simulation, or universe, this temporal version is not guaranteed for any amount of time. Marcus Aurelius says, 
You could leave this earth right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. Sometimes I forget that. A lot of times I forget that. <laughs> and yes, death right now from any number of things is unlikely for you right now, but make no mistake, it is coming. Recently, I had an experience that what I feel like Arjuna must have felt like in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, where God reveals himself to him. I was reading about experiencing each moment for what it is not needing anymore within this book, within Untethered Soul, that each moment is enough. And then all of a sudden I felt this intense vibration and it felt like I, I heard a gong through my whole being, a gong. Then I felt a surge of joy and I just started laughing. I don't know what that was. I don't know if that's a product of me suggesting to myself that I should feel this way and have this some sort of re revelation or if this was some sort of revelation or if I tapped in to the infinite and if I'm crazy, but it felt like bliss. It felt like a wave of bliss or coming out of it and into something more real. Should I be going for that at all times? Can I walk through the grocery store with this gong of bliss flowing through me without scaring the shit out of everybody around me? <laughs> Robert Greene says, in the face of the sublime, we feel a shiver, something too large for our minds to encompass. And for a moment, it shakes us out of our smugness and releases us from the death-like grip of habit and banality. Can we exist on that plane at all times? I mean, uh, this interview that I watched with Eckhart Tolle tonight, he seems all right. He doesn't seem like a crazy person. But I feel like when I if I were to tap into those states, I would be a crazy person. Part of this stuff is difficult for me because I, I never want to feel like I'm getting tricked. I never want to feel like I'm putting my faith in something that can't be explained, that can't be backed up with facts or science or numbers or experience. I feel like if I give myself over to this unconditional happiness, to this seat of the self, like somehow I'm being tricked. But then what does it matter? Really? Because do I want to be happy or do I want to be skeptical and sad? What good is knowledge if you're fucking miserable? But this is my tether to the rational. Untethered soul. Untether it, Corey. There's that good third person talk. Untether it and get that frappuccino, baby. I don't want to seem crazy or stupid or naive to follow this stuff, but it does feel different than other therapies that I've experienced. So am I in fact going crazy or am I coming back to some sort of sanity? Am I polishing a mirror that's now really showing me something real? My soul. I don't know if that experience was, was real or I'm not real because I felt it. It was real in whatever it was, but whether it was temporal or universal, I'm not sure. I don't know if this was the self or, or God or the Atman or Brahman or whatever the term is, the Godhead inside, but it does feel like something more, something that I keep wanting to explore, this different experience. I want to keep going. I want to keep trying to keep fading back and behind. He says to fade back and behind, to keep, to shine the spotlight on the self. This is the practical tip. Nassim Nicholas Taleb says, for the classics, philosophical insight was the product of a life of leisure. For me, a life of leisure is the product of philosophical insight. I feel like that taps into what this is, that if you can steal peace from the self, this philosophical insight, literally and figuratively sight, insight, there is peace there, there is leisure, there is a life different than what we're experiencing most of the time. This tense grip on temporal reality, on material reality. It feels like with these ideas, the mind can be broken while the spirit is always whole. The self is whole because there is always a neutral witness. There is always the self. Otherwise, what is experiencing this? Barbara Holmes says in Crisis Contemplation, Healing the Global Village, mysticism reminds us that the boundaries between this life and the life beyond are permeable, and that our power is not seated in what is bestowed by politicians and society, but to everyone willing and ready to recognize the moves of an active Holy Spirit. 
By being receptive to the things that we don't understand, we fling open the center of our being to the mysteries of the divine. Yeah, Barbara, it felt like I kicked some fucking doors down with that experience. Every moment is worth living. That's what he says. That's what Michael says. I'm trying to find that. This way of staying whole. I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to tap into this. And whether we're all quantifiably connected or not by a self, by a universe, by a godhead, by a oneness, we are all still connected. You can see it in everybody else. Their joy, their pain, their anger, their love. We feel it. So over and over again, we must fall back, fall back into the witness behind the senses, watch and learn, literally. You don't reach for it, you just let go of the temporal. Here I am, I'm the one saying let go now. I don't wanna be tricked, but when you listen to those who have done it or have purported to have done it, they didn't need to die to experience this sort of unmatched joy and union. And there have been many who have talked about this and described this over thousands of years. There's something called the Lindy effect that I learned about recently where specifically with something like books, the older it is, the more weight you can put into its value because it's lasted the amount of time that it's lasted. And if people have talked about this for thousands of years, perhaps in our modern Apple, Google, Yelp society, maybe we're missing something. Something a bit more basic, something inside. They say I can come back to the self, I can, I can steal peace from there because the observer is always watching. The self is always watching. You're judging, the self is watching. Come back to that instead. It's not the journey or the destination, it's the present. The last thing he talks about in this book is that God's love, this, this, this self, this oneness is always there and that it burns like the sun in the same way that you can turn away but the sun keeps shining and that if you want to feel it if you want to see it if you want to experience it all you have to do is turn back around and look feel it tap into it sit in the seat of the self and let go